It's great to be back here at Stanford. And when Danielle sent around the invitation, I came to think of a lecture given here in the spring of 1981 by Ivan and Gerald Gaster. And the major technical innovation was they used two overhead projectors. <laughs> and they worked them in tandem. <laughs> the audience was in awe. Uh, the major theoretical innovation that they were talking about, the lecture was of course about GPSG and they talked about slashed categories, <coughs> which uh, as we all know in, meant a shift of focus from movement transformations to uh, looking at, uh, to encoding the information as part of complex syntactic categories. Uh, Gasler's original notation, you'll recognize in 1A here, uh, where, when's the name slash? <clears throat> and the idea of a slash uh, was then uh, implemented in HPSG as part of the feature structure. Uh, and it involved unification of the initial constituent with the value of slash, which then bottomed out uh, uh, the absence of a noun phrase. So, as you all know, the slash feature is then instantiated on all the paths uh, which connect the filler and the gap, uh, the so-called extraction path. And this idea of an extraction path, now I'll need a pointer, I think, at some point, um, uh, turned out to be very useful. It uh, could account for, uh, for rel uh, relative clause, uh, complementizer selection in Irish, tonal downstep in Kikuyu, and a lot of other things. You can read Annie Zanen's paper on syntactic binding from 83 to read up about them. And also parasitic gaps. But I'm not going to talk about parasitic gaps today. Instead, I'm going to talk about uh, a new, uh, an ongoing change in Swedish, which looks rather puzzling at first, but which becomes understandable when you think of it in terms of extraction paths. Uh, you need to know two things uh, about Swedish. It's a verb second language. The finite verb comes in second position in declarative clauses. And it has, over the years, developed a strong subject requirement. If all tense clauses have to have subjects, and if there's no uh, referential subject, then you have to stick in an expletive. And it's D, uh, which is uh, indistinguishable from the neuter singular pronoun. <clears throat> so this is required. Uh, it's required in weather expressions, in, in personal constructions, and like in the example in two, when you have an extra post clause. Det var bra att du kunde komma. Uh, when D is initial, it can be left out in casual speech. But if D is not initial, as in three, when you have a, like a small adverb in the initial position and D appears post-verbally, it cannot be left out. Okay, so with this little mini lecture on Swedish, you should all be surprised when I tell you that Swedish speakers also say things like in four. Det var dumt att du sa. Okay, now what's going on here? So there is a, clearly a gap of this set. We can see that because an example where there's no gap when there's no filler. So here's the filler, there's the gap. In five, there's no link to this position, and there you have to express the object. Okay. Now, the only thing is that this that clause is an extra post clause, and I just told you that you had to have expletive subjects. But where's the expletive subject? Can't hear it, can't see it. <clears throat> so, um, 
we go back and start look at this sentence without any frontings, uh, it will be something like in six. Det var dumt att du sa det. Starting off with the expletive, which I've marked with a little X to make it clear. And then you have the extra post clause that you said it. And then when we front, we get seven. Det var det dumt att du sa. With two dates, one referential and one expletive. The problem is, people don't say this. They say, hey, det var dumt att du sa. Which then looks like there is a null expletive in the subject position. I first started noticing these in the 1990s in uh, informal speech, radio broadcasts. And here are a few more examples. Det är klart att du ska göra. Det är ju roligt om hon får. Det är ju så många som gör. So, what they have in common is that they start off with the, followed by either a modal auxiliary or an evaluative adjective, and then a finite clause with an object gap. Yeah. And the finite clause can be a that clause, an if clause, or a relative clause. Let's see how we could uh, view this if we look at the extraction parts in more detail. And here is a tree in some kind of hybrid notation, just to give, a, give you an idea of what's going on. So here's the filler, and the slash feature uh, carries the information about the, the form of the filler, that it's D, all the way down to the missing object. But there is one other constituent in this tree which is constrained to be of the form D. And that's this noun phrase here, which is the one that licenses the extra post clause. And whereas the grammar, of course, requires both these noun phrases really to be spelled out as D, it seems like the processor, just in case, is expecting a D, but it's also looking for a D it can sort of overlook it. Now, if this is on the right track, that you get this overlooked form uh, expletive subject precisely when there is an <coughs> unbounded dependency involving a referential deal, then this makes a prediction. You shouldn't find these uh, um, unrealized expletives just in the matrix clause, you should also find them further down the extraction path. And this is actually what we find. <coughs> so here's an example. Det tycker jag var bra att du sa. Where the missing expletive is a bit down the road. I'll just... So the tree would be something like this, where it's the subject of the embedded clause that's missing. Okay. <clears throat> these kinds of examples, in particular these ones, are very interesting from, uh, in, if, from the point of view of incremental processing. Um, let's step through this one. So, the processor first here is Det tycker jag and may very well postulate that, okay, here's a fronted object, and I found the gap. Uh, Tycker in Swedish very often takes D as object. But then, the utterance continues with a finite verb, var bra. So the processor has to reanalyze this <coughs> as the beginning of a subordinate clause, this time with a missing subject, because it could be the missing subject, right? But the utterance goes on, Det tycker jag var bra att du sa, with another uh, embedded clause which where you find the real gap. Uh, and then the uh, intermediate gap has to be, uh, well, you can see it, it has to be reanalyzed as an empty expletive. But 
these examples don't seem to be cause any problems. Neither for the speakers, there are no hesitations or uh, restarts or corrections, nor for listeners, there's no evidence that they cause problems in understanding. So whatever the processor is doing, it's doing it very rapidly. And the processor also handles examples like this um, very well. Uh, this is from an interview with a former heroin addict who speaks rather slowly. And he says, uh, talking about quitting, and he says, "Det är alltid någon annan som vill att man ska göra." And when we get to that pause after once, vill, that's a very plausible gap for the initial D. But instead, he continues, and you reach the uh, final gap after göra, do. At which point, the processor has to reanalyze the, that clause as the object of one but it doesn't seem to be problematic. Okay, these examples, enough Swedish for a while. Uh, uh, they all start with D, and which is, as we've seen, uh, either expletive or referential. And that means that all the examples remain ambiguous until you reach the end of the utterance, because you don't know if there's going to be a gap or not. It's actually exactly like in English, in English tough movement. So uh, starting off with this, ex oops. this example, it's hard. The it here has to be an anaphoric referential pronoun. It's hard to live, an expletive. It's hard to tell. Now, again, it has to be referential because of the gap. It's hard to tell the truth. It switches back to an expletive. But of course, the processor doesn't know at the point when it's processing the it is, etc., whether there will be a gap in the subsequent infinitival clause. Swedish tough movements it work exactly the same way, but and in addition, we have these uh, cases which I've shown you, where we have finite complement clauses. Uh, and you have this, the Swedish processor has the same problem of not knowing, is it dealing with a referential or an expletive there? Det var dumt att du kom. Well, has to be expletive. Det var dumt att du sa. Okay, here's a gap. So the initial there has to be referential. Det är ju så många som gör det. Expletive. Det är så många som gör. Referential. And given that the processor can't tell whether an initial D is expletive or referential until the end of the utterance, I believe that it must keep both options open. Uh, and I'm not aware of any problems that this causes the processor in terms of uh, reanalysis. Okay, uh, here you have a bunch of, of these Swedish, Swedish examples. And we've seen that English has similar ambiguities in tough constructions. So why hasn't this developed in English? I think the main reason is the way uh, preposing is used in Swedish. In particular, preposing of uh, unaccented pronouns. So if we take a question like, do you like to make bread? In Swedish I can answer, ja, det är trevligt, with an unaccented initial pronoun. As I, in English I could say, yes, it's nice. In Swedish I could also say, ja, det tycker jag är trevligt. But that doesn't work very well in English. You don't say, yes, it I think is nice. You could say, yes, that I think is nice. But notice that if you do that, you introduce a, a notion of a contrast. It's baking, making bread as opposed to something else. And that uh, notion of contrast is just not there in the B example. 
And from B, there's just a short step to the examples we've been looking at. Det tycker jag är trevligt att jag får göra. So, I think the, the reason we find this is this tendency in Swedish to front pronouns to maintain coherence in the discussion. I've talked a fair bit about processing strategies here. But, unfortunately, we don't know very much about how these utterances are processed. So, next step is, of course, to do experiments, preferably online experiments, and see if we can trace the, uh, the processing load at various points in these utterances. Okay, thanks. Four minutes for questions. Okay. So, if that initial bit is referential, what prevents it from being something else like a pulling uh, <clears throat> Okay. Most of my data, <coughs> what I've shown you is all authentic data, uh, involves uh, the pronoun D. I have a few, few examples with demonstratives. And maybe a handful with full lexical noun phrases. Uh, the way I ex uh, interpret that is that this uh, construction is, is actually spreading and that the requirement that it has to be precisely uh, the, the filler date is being loosened. But there is a certain amount of conventionalization in this and we see this because we find a similar pattern in Norwegian, which is very much like Swedish, but not in Danish, which is also very much like Swedish. So, at some point, some of these became like catchy phrases and they are spreading through the language. Peter? Yeah, you didn't really want to talk about the 80s, but I can't help but wonder um, if there's an overt complementizer in front of the position where the date should go. Do you have any data like that? Uh, no, I don't, no. Uh, and then I, I expect we would have uh, an overt day. So the passing account would have to... Yeah, but the, but the, the Swedish processor <laughs> will have to, or has to, is able to handle resumptive pronouns, we, we know, so... Mm. Last question? Okay. 